Hello and welcome everyone to tonight's webinar on Undergraduate Information Technology courses at Charles Sturt University. Glad you could make it along tonight. My name is Jason Howarth. I'm a course director here at Charles Sturt. Not a very well course director tonight. I've got a bit of a flu, so if you do hear my voice getting a bit croaky, you'll know why. So great that you could join us tonight. Uh, we're going to go through our various undergraduate courses at CSU, what's involved in studying those courses and a little bit about the content of those courses tonight. So hope you enjoy. Uh, a few housekeeping rules before we start. If you do have a question tonight, we have muted everyone's microphones just to make the whole session a little bit easier to manage. But if you do have a question tonight, I have Sandra from the contact centre here helping me out as well as Sonia. Uh, you can type a question into the questions window uh, of the GoToMeeting panel and uh, hopefully we can answer that one tonight. If for some reason we can't, we'll have to take that on notice and we'll get back to you with an answer. But please type any questions into the questions box as we proceed. Okay, so let's kick off. We are recording this session so that if you uh, did miss it, you should be able to view the recording or for some reason if you have to leave early. So um, that's me, Jason Howe. I'm a course director, as I said, at Charles Sturt. There's my email address. Always happy to hear from potential students. If you do want to know more information, just drop me an email. I am responsible for managing information technology courses throughout the Faculty of Business at CSU. And that means everything from helping to promote those courses, helping to design the courses along with lecturers, uh, helping to get the courses uh, accredited with the Australian Computer Society, which is kind of a stamp of, of their quality once a course is accredited and all of our undergraduate courses are accredited with the Australian Computer Society, as well as talking to students and helping them through their studies. So a varied role and certainly if you study at CSU in an IT course, uh, you'll come into contact with me from the start right through to the very end. So I also read out students' names at graduation as they uh, cross the stage. That's a very pleasurable part of my role. So tonight, want to talk about CSU overall. What, why would you study at CSU? Uh, and, and indeed, why would you want to study an undergraduate degree at all? We'll then take a closer look at a couple of our undergraduate courses, our two main undergraduate courses, the Bachelor of Information Technology and the Bachelor of Computer Science. Take a look at the, uh, the course content, a fairly brief overview there of what you'll study inside those courses, the, the content. Uh, we'll then look at things like course delivery. I assume most people attending tonight would perhaps be interested in distance education and if that's the case you've certainly come to the right university. Charles Sturt is famous for its distance education courses. We've been doing distance delivery for a long time and we do have a very large cohort of what we call DE students. So I'll tell you a little bit more about uh, the way we deliver our courses by distance. What are some of the, uh, the more obvious questions regarding entry conditions? How much time uh, is required from you as a student in order to do justice to your studies? Uh, credit, uh, that is recognition of prior learning. Uh, getting credit is certainly a way of cutting down both the cost and the length of your course. So we'll talk about credit, uh, subject cost, and also how and when to apply. At the very end, we'll then have the opportunity to ask any more questions. But please feel free to ask questions as the presentation proceeds. So there's just a couple of uh, pictures of, of CSU and they're not all in the one place because CSU is a very dispersed network of campuses. So you may or may not know that we have campuses in Bathurst, uh, Wagga, Albury, uh, smaller campuses at Orange, Dubbo and Port Macquarie. Uh, we also have uh, partner relationships in both Sydney and Melbourne which tends to be more for international students studying uh, bachelors or master's degrees, but there's also smaller, smaller campuses which focus on particular studies, for example at Canberra where we have uh, a strong theology program, uh, and Goulburn and Manly where we have a policing program. So CSU is a really, a really large network of campuses. If you are studying as a distance education student, you're always welcome to attend, uh, to visit our campuses. We always love to see our students. We also have full access to the facilities on those campuses such as the library, uh, the, the sporting facilities and of course you can come in and have a chat to your lecturers or to me as the course director. So don't feel as a distance education student that you're somehow cut out from, from campus life because you're certainly welcome to come along. 
Just to give you an indication, I mentioned uh, that we're a, a major distance education university. And if you look at the number of on-campus students that CSU has, uh, don't have the exact figure, but it's around about 10,000 on-campus students compared to 25,000 distance education students. So distance education is CSU's main game. Okay, so it's not as if as a distance education student, you're the poor cousin of an on-campus student, you would actually form part of our, our main teaching cohort. Okay, so that's a little bit about CSU. Um, we're one of the leading providers of distance education in Australia, as I mentioned. Uh, we're also, in terms of IT, the leading postgraduate distance education provider in Australia. So have a very strong set of IT programs, both at the undergraduate level, which is basically your bachelor's degree, and also the postgraduate level. So postgraduate basically refers to degrees that you would do after you get an undergraduate degree, so master's programs, etc. But tonight we're talking about undergraduate programs. All of our IT degrees at undergraduate level are fully accredited to the professional level with the Australian Computer Society. As I said, that is a check of their, of their validity, of their quality. And uh, all of our degrees have a strong professional focus. So CSU is a leader in terms of students getting a job. And that's something we pride ourselves on. We aren't really, our, our mission is not so much to produce academics. We want to produce people uh, who are ready for the professions. And that's very much the focus of our mission. And it's very much the focus of the courses that I'm going to talk about tonight. And I'm biased, but we have, we have great lecturing staff as well. So uh, I'll talk a little bit more about the lecturers shortly. <clears throat> I mentioned before about distance education, so I won't dwell on this too much. But that's an indication compared to other universities in Australia uh, and our distance education enrolment. So you can see there on the right hand side is Charles Sturt, uh, showing up over 25,000 students there. The next closest is Southern Queensland followed by Deakin and New England. But you can see that compared to the other universities in Oz, uh, we're well ahead when it comes to distance education provision. And so it's something that we're very good at. So one thing that I alluded to at the start is you might decide that CSU is a good uni for you. You might decide that the courses that we offer are relevant. But there's the bigger question of why you would want to come to university at all. And I really love this graph, which is a few, old, few years old now. But it's, it does indicate a clear trend. Uh, this is regarding unemployment, unemployment and your level of education compared to the unemployment rates. So you can see on the left hand side there you've got the Australian unemployment rates. It was a snapshot from about 10 years ago now, but it's not so much the, the age of this, it's the trend that it's showing. Um, below upper secondary, and you can see there blue and the, the hatched colour there represents females, the blue males. We'll ignore that distinction for now. But you can see as you move from below upper secondary to upper secondary, to tertiary non-uni, which is basically the VET sector, TAFE, and along to university, you can see a definite falling away there of unemployment percentage. So in, in some cases it's a no-brainer. The, the more qualifications that you have, the less you're likely to be unemployed. There are similar graphs as well, I don't have them here tonight, showing that the more qualifications that you have, on average, the higher the salary that you earn as well. Of course, these are averages. We can always think of cases where people left school at 14 and went to, on to make millions of dollars. But when you look at broad averages, um, this, this is the case that education pays and education means that you're less likely to be uh, unemployed, particularly long-term unemployed. OK, I mentioned the lecturers at CSU. I just wanted you to, to see some of their faces. These lecturers are across multiple campuses particularly Albury, uh, Wagga and Bathurst. And we have lecturers in, in every imaginable specialisation within IT. We have lecturers who are specialists in computer programming, uh, statistics, lecturers who focus on um, computer networking, on artificial intelligence, other networkers whose focus is perhaps more esoteric, such as neural algorithms, uh, others who are specialists in the computer gaming area. So, 
a really broad range of, of lecturers and who are specialists in their various areas. Okay, and, and this roughly matches up to the subjects that we teach naturally. So uh, as we go through talking about our subjects tonight, and we might talk about subjects that deal with computer graphics or that deal with uh, programming in Java, we, we have specialist lecturers in each of those areas who not only are great teachers, but who publish in those areas and create new knowledge in each of those different teaching areas. So as the course director at Charles Sturt of IT, I manage a, a broad suite of courses. You can see there undergraduate and postgraduate. What we're going to focus on tonight are a couple of the undergraduate courses, the Bachelor of Information Technology and the Bachelor of Computer Science. Uh, there will be a webinar presentation next Thursday where I'll be talking about the postgraduate courses. So if you are interested in hearing about postgraduate IT at CSU, there is a webinar available next Thursday. Uh, just drop me an email if you want details about that and we can arrange to get you registered for that one. Okay, so let's talk about the Bachelor of Information Technology. Uh, it's a long-standing degree at CSU. It's been running for well over uh, probably near 20 years now. It's obviously t had a lot of changes in that time as, as IT evolves. Uh, it's an undergraduate qualification that allows you in some sense to tailor uh, to your own interests within the IT discipline. And we do that through allowing you to choose a major in a specific area of IT, but also allowing you to choose subjects, a selection of subjects from any area. And they don't necessarily need to be from information technology, they could be from mathematics, they could be from the arts, they could be from some other area. So very much uh, an open degree in many ways. It's also a degree that's very business focused. So unlike uh, the Bachelor of Computer Science, which tends to be much more, dare I say, nerdy, uh, Bachelor of IT is very much tailored towards people who want to get a career in IT and possibly that career will be within a business. As we know, uh, IT is pervasive, so coming out of a Bachelor of IT degree, you might work in a variety of areas and for a variety of businesses. You might work in an accounting firm. You might work at a university managing networks. You might work uh, with council or with the public service. So the Bachelor of IT takes advantage of the fact that every business more or less needs information technology and needs someone to manage the whole process. So when we look at what the course actually consists of, it's 24 subjects. Uh, broken down into 10 core subjects. So core subjects means that everyone must do those. There's no, there's no variation in the core. Eight subjects that form part of a major which you select. So you can choose to specialise in different areas such as network engineering or software design. And as I mentioned before, six what we call unrestricted electives, subjects that you can choose from anywhere. They might be more computing subjects, or that they might be subjects from some other faculty or discipline in the university. So um, they, they could be more business. They could be business subjects, mathematics subjects, what have you. Whatever, whatever takes your interest. Often that's really good from an employer's perspective because employers are just looking for people, particularly in business, who know computing and nothing else. It's really good to have a little bit of a, a broad knowledge uh, that extends beyond uh, just computing. So there's a list of our majors there, current as at session two this year, uh, software design and development, network engineering, systems administration, there are our three most popular majors, extending down then into online systems, IT management and systems analysis. So what we're going to do tonight is not go through all of the majors in depth, we'll have a look at some of them, but let's first of all start with the core subjects. So every student must do these. Uh, just going through them quickly one by one. Every student needs to do what's called MGT100, so that's the, the subject code. Every subject at CSU has a code. Uh, organisations and management. So as I mentioned earlier, really important for people coming out of a Bachelor of IT degree to have an understanding of business as well, because more than likely that's where you're going to end up working, within, within a business environment. So that one teaches you all about the fundamentals behind organisational philosophies and, and management principles. 
ITC 105, the next one down, business and technical communications. Very strongly related to the notion of working within a business. One of the common complaints, if there is one, about people who are IT professionals is that they tend to be not as strong in the communications area, personal communications. That's a really valuable and powerful skill to have. If you've got technical savvy and you're also a good communicator, then you, you'll likely very quickly rise up the corporate ladder. Okay, so really important that you can be a good communicator and even if you just want to focus wholly and solely on IT, you still need to talk to end users, you still need to talk to clients and the sorts of needs they have with systems. So that's why we teach communications within this course. Moving down to ITC 106, Programming Principles. Uh, we take the view that every student, no matter what area you're eventually going to specialise in, every student of IT should have a knowledge of basic programming. So this one uh, gives you that knowledge. We use the Python language for this and it just takes you to the level where you know how to write a computer program using Python, you know how a program is structured and you know about syntax, how to compile. Obviously if you're doing software development you would go much further than this but even if you're doing networking this allows you then to perhaps create scripts in a networking environment which might be useful in your working life. So that's ITC 106. ITC 114 database management systems teaches about the fundamentals of creating a database and managing a database. Also how to query a database using what's called uh, SQL, the structured query language. So you can have a database of records, let's say for example say it's a database of, of politicians, we might want to press delete at the moment but you might want to query give me all the politicians who were in government between 1996 and 1998 and we would teach you how to write those queries uh, using the structured query language to interrogate the database. Computer Systems ITC 161 really teaches you the fundamentals of how a computer works. You're looking at the CPU, how a computer is put together, uh, random access memory, storage, uh, clock cycles, the whole functioning of a computer system. ITC 211 Systems Analysis is very much devoted to uh, how to talk to clients who want systems. So in, in our profession, often we'll be engaging with end users who want something out of IT. It might be a network, it might be a computer program. We need to be able to elicit those requirements from the user as well as to be able to design a system. When we start designing a system, whether it's a network or a computer program, you don't just go for it. Uh, like a good architect, you design a blueprint uh, using models and systems analysis teaches you all about not only how to find out what the user wants but also how to model what they want before we actually delve into uh, constructing the solution. ITC 242, data communications, is all about basic networking. Basic networking and as the name says, data communications. How are signals transferred uh, across a network, across a wire, across optic fibre or through uh, wireless signals. So they're all about uh, how to configure basic networks, network topologies, how networks function. Moving on to ITC 301, IT project management. Uh, one interesting thing about working in IT is that it's fairly rare for you to work in isolation unless you're in a really small business you're likely to come together with other IT professionals or people from other discipline areas working on large projects. They might be software solutions, they might be business solutions of some other nature, but really important for IT people to know how to work within a project and how to manage a project. And the last couple of units there, uh, ethics and professional practice really does talk about uh, what's required for you to behave ethically as an IT professional and ITC 358 ICT management and information security as we know IT security is again another pervasive thing within IT. Uh, important that security is designed into systems from the ground up and hence we, we do 
um, have a unit dedicated to ICT security. Uh, now there's a question from Sean about units on project management, whether they're accredited by the Project Management Professional Association. Uh, not to my knowledge, Sean, no they're not. But if you do have project management certification such as PMP or perhaps Prince2 uh, Practitioner, we could certainly look at those certifications for credit into uh, our program, basically giving you credit for the IT project management subject. But to my knowledge, the actual unit is not accredited with the PMP Association. Okay, so that's the core set of subjects that we have within the Bachelor of IT degree. We spent a little bit of time on those. I don't want to go into an enormous amount of depth within the majors. Just going to have a look at a couple of popular majors here and the subjects that are involved in those. Right down the bottom, it's an interesting uh, statement that I pulled out from a report recently from the Australian Government, uh, basically indicating that the largest employing IT, ICT professional occupation was software and applications programming. 85,000 people are listed in that, followed by database security and then business and systems analysts and computer networking professionals. So that's a report uh, from the Australian Government. It's available at employment.gov.au. It's a really interesting report to read through. It does look at various trends within the ICT industry. The reason I put it there was it relates directly to the major that we're talking about, which is software design and development. So this major teaches you how to program in a nutshell. So if we're looking there from the top, just going through a few selected units, Doing this major, you would start out in programming in Java 1, which teaches you how to program in a fully fledged object oriented programming language called Java. So you'd be learning how to create classes and objects, how to have those objects communicate with each other to solve a problem, and to basically code up some fairly sophisticated and, and uh, extensive computer programs using Java. You can see down there it has a, a twin unit, if you like, Oops. programming in Java 2. Uh, where we go further, we start to move into the, the graphical user interface area much more, uh, starting to program extensive uh, Java programs using graphical user interface, such as designing forms, uh, widgets, uh, and other associated graphical components and showing how all of those interact together to, meet, to, to create a, a workable and useful computer program. Down the bottom, or towards the bottom there, ITC322 data structures. You're learning again how to use Java to program uh, structures where we can organise information. So not sure how many of you are familiar with programming, but often in a program we need to create collections of, of objects or collections of data, and we need to organise that in some way. For example, we might be writing a program on a cricket team where we might want to have individual cricketers represented by objects within our program, but we also want to treat these individuals sometimes as a team and we want to organise those 11 individuals as a collection uh, within a data structure, so essentially as a collection class. So data structures uh, teaches you how to manipulate data in that way. You can see down the bottom there you've got some other subjects. ITC 204 is an interesting one, user interface design and evaluation. Really important as we design good programs that are actually going to be uh, usable and acceptable to the end user, that we have some basic understanding, or more than basic, but strong understanding of what works in the user interface design area. Regarding things like colours, spacing, uh, layout of, of uh, real estate on the screen. So that subject does teach you uh, very much about how we use graphical components to best advantage. Another interesting set of subjects that you'll see there on the screen, they're actually highlighted in grey. 303 Software Engineering and ITC 309 Software Development Project. In those subjects you're basically at the end of your degree uh, doing a major project for a client and that might be that might be a real client or it might be a pretend client with a pretend problem, but in the end what you're doing is you're given a set of specifications and out of that set of specifications you have to go through the process of 
uh, modelling the system and designing a fairly comprehensive software system and indeed presenting it uh, perhaps virtually to uh, a group of your peers, something that's acceptable to the end user. So very much uh, simulating what's, what's going to happen as a software development professional. Moving along now to network engineering. Uh, this major basically allows you to become or teaches you to become a networking professional. Um, it's a, a unique major in the sense that the three units there, network engineering one, two and three, actually correspond to the Cisco CCNA curriculum. So once you come out of this major through study of network engineering one, two and three, you will have covered the Cisco CCNA curriculum and you will be in fact eligible to go and sit for that CCNA uh, exam. Okay, so very much a practically focused uh, program. Uh, computer security, as we mentioned, is a pervasive thing, uh, important to all practitioners. Right down the bottom you can see some, some other units which you can take. One on wireless networks, uh, another one on a hot area in the industry, virtualization and cloud computing. As with the software development major, you can see that you've got a couple of subjects, ITC 308 project preparation and ITC 306 project preparation and 308 IT project. Similar thing, you're given a, a significant networking project in those units. It happens towards the end of your degree and you have to come up with some solution. It might be configuring a network, it might be um, designing some sort of a network plan uh, but in the end, it, it gives you real practical experience with the concepts that you've learned. And our final uh, major that we're going to take a snapshot look at tonight is the systems administration major. I like to think of this as an all-rounder major. Uh, and to conceptualise it, a lot of people in IT work for businesses where maybe IT, as I said, is not the main, the main purpose of the business. Particularly in smaller to medium businesses, IT guys or indeed women, tend to be the troubleshooters. So you've got to do a little bit of everything. Programming, uh, maybe a little bit of server administration, a little bit of network configuration. So this, this major, the systems admin major, tries to get you across a lot of different areas within IT to allow you to be sort of an all-rounder an all -rounder within the industry. Look, that's all I'll say tonight about the Bachelor of IT and the selected majors. Uh, you can see there a link down the bottom which is a link to the undergraduate handbook, uh, which is online. Uh, I, I won't click that now, but you can just type into Google, Charles State University Bachelor of Information Technology Handbook 2014, and you can see a full list of, of what I've displayed tonight. You can also click on the individual subject units and learn a little bit more about those. Okay, a question there from Stephen. With the network engineering major, uh, are you able to pick the third under the six unrestricted electives you can choose? Yes, Stephen, most certainly. So um, you would choose any two of the three subjects listed there. Uh, if you wanted to choose all three, that would be fine. You just count one of those against your unrestricted electives. Okay, uh, another thing, just before I get off the Bachelor of IT, this is also of relevance to the computer science course. Uh, we're always changing and evolving. I think one of the benefits of, of CSU, one of, one of the strengths, is that we do change and add subjects into our curriculum as the market changes to make it as relevant as possible for you guys. As from next year, within the Bachelor of IT, we have four new subjects on offer. Um, ITC 132, Customer Support Management, that's actually based on the Help Desk Association, Help Desk Analyst Certification. Okay, so it mightn't sound all that exciting, but a really important uh, topic area for you to help get your foot in the door of the IT industry. So you don't probably want to end up in the Help Desk area, but as a starting point, a really useful uh, way to get your foot into the door. So that's coming next year. Uh, as well, we'll be adding another subject, Professional Programming Practice to the software development major which teaches you all about designing robust programs, testing, debugging, the whole development cycle which is really focused on designing quality programs. Another one added to the course from next year, mobile application development. 
uh, which teaches you how to do it, how to design and write apps for the Android platform using Java. And finally, another unit coming next year, ITC 232, Technical Support Management, which is based on the Microsoft Certified Desktop Technician certification. So you can see here a strong alignment between what's being taught in some of the industry certifications that are really important and the syllabus in some of our subjects. And for you, this means that what you're studying is really relevant uh, when you go out into industry. Okay, let's have a breather. Uh, I'm just going to have a quick sip of my cup of tea to rest my croaky voice. If there's any questions now, we can perhaps uh, type them into the questions window and I can answer those and uh, we can proceed in another minute or so. Okay, so that might do me for my rest. My throat feels uh, like 0.1% better. We can move on to the Bachelor of Computer Science. Uh, so it's our other main undergraduate program. Unlike the Bachelor of IT, it tends to have much more of a, a hardcore computing focus. Um, let's go through, uh, as we did with the Bachelor of IT, let's go through the subjects and give you a bit of an overview of what's involved. A little less choice in the Bachelor of Computer Science. It has a core set of units uh, that total 16. Like the Bachelor of IT, it's, it's 24 subjects overall, 24 subjects in total, of which 16 are core subjects, so everyone must do those. So just going through a whirlwind tour of the core subjects, ITC 104, Introduction to Computer Science, is really teaching you the fundamentals of not just how computers work, as we did in, in uh, the Bachelor of IT, but starting to move into uh, simple programming, um, simple algorithms to understand how we might solve some basic computational problems. We're also looking at uh, things like data manipulation, um, data abstractions, uh, the theory of computation, and a little bit there as well on XHTML. So a bit of a an all-rounder subject, but really focused on an understanding of, of how the computer works from a computer science point of view. ITC 105, we've, we've mentioned about the importance of communications. Uh, ITC 114, we've also spoken about that. That, uh, of course, is database. ITC 203, object-oriented systems analysis and design, really does teach you about the whole design of an object-oriented computer system. Again, the whole idea of modelling and designing a system before we actually jump in and start coding the system, uh, this tip takes you through that, that process, including the standard uh, design diagrams that we use within IT called the UML, UML, the Unified Modelling Language. So you get a full introduction to that. Basically teaches you how to design blueprints, almost like to become a software, a software architect. ITC 204, Human-computer interaction. We've spoken briefly about that one. Uh, it's it's about designing a system that is going to be uh, both usable and agreeable to the to the end user. Obviously, really important in this course because if you're going to start to move in not just computer science and business systems, but if you're going to start designing games, then clearly the user interface is is a really key part of of the game design. If if it's a crappy interface, if it's not pleasurable to interact with or it's confusing, then the user is probably going to give up on your game. A uh, question here from Chris. Uh, if taking the course by a distance, is it easy to complete the units faster than others if you are well experienced? Uh, double answer to that question, Chris. Uh, there is an exam, so there is a structure to the subject as we progress. Uh, you, you can certainly uh, race ahead if you're really experienced in that area and submit your assignments early, but at the end of the day, uh, the final exam period is, is set aside and that's two weeks towards the end of session. So even though you might submit assignments perhaps a little bit earlier, 
or you might breeze through the subject. Effectively, you would finish the subject along with everyone else. If the subject was really easy to you, maybe you've got a lot of experience in that area, maybe the recommendation would be to take on more subjects. So getting through faster in that way by studying more subjects. And there certainly is the flexibility to take on a higher study load. We'll talk about that a little more in a moment. Uh, ITC 205, Professional Programming Practice. We have spoken briefly about that. That's also going to appear in the Bachelor of IT from next year. So you're looking at things like debugging, uh, testing, version control, uh, also uh, stuff like defensive programming, uh, programming by contract. So really looking at the things behind uh, really high quality uh, programming and designing the quality as you go along, not something that's sort of tacked on at the end or designing a, a mediocre system and then trying to fix all the bugs at the very end, but using a methodical approach to design quality in from the outset. We've spoken about programming in Java 1. Java is our main programming language at Charles Sturt, and that's the case for both the Bachelor of Computer Science and the Bachelor of IT. ITC 222, Computer Organisation. Uh, in that subject, you're looking at stuff uh, like instruction sets, uh, the use of registers, memory models. Uh, in particular, you're starting to look at, at things like assembly programming. So there is some assembly programming in that, in that subject, but you're also looking at uh, computational maths, um, memory and uh, different memory techniques for, for, for the way computers uh, optimise main memory, uh, how a CPU works in detail, uh, compiler optimization. so a very much traditional computer science subject. 242 data comms and computer networks, we've also mentioned that one before, the fundamentals of, of computer networks and how signals are, are exchanged between computers within a network, also basic network topologies. Uh, ITC 262 operating systems, that's fairly uh, self-explanatory, looking at the whole concept of, of an operating system, how it mediates between the user and the hardware. ITC 313 and 322, we've, we've spoken about those, programming in Java 2 and data structures. Interesting one there, 364, uh, computational intelligence. That is a subject that deals with artificial intelligence. That's very important, not only in computer science, in games programming as well. If you're going to program a game that's, that's engaging, you want, for example, the computer to be a reasonably intelligent enemy. So if you're going to write a game like Halo and you're going to be shooting up uh, grunts and elites and things like that, you want them to react in a way that's fairly competitive. Okay, of course grunts, for those of you who know Halo, don't show much intelligence, but uh, elites, for example, will know how to perhaps dodge bullets, hide behind obstacles and maybe mount some sort of a counter-attack. So uh, a really important concept within uh, games programming is artificial intelligence. This is a computer science degree, so there is some mathematics. Uh, it tends to be lighter than many other computer science degrees. We don't go overboard with the maths, but certainly uh, if you're petrified of maths, um, I would question whether you should be doing uh, computer science, but that doesn't mean you need to have heaps of experience in maths. We do take you uh, through the maths that you need, beginning with Math 105, Introductory Mathematics, and in that subject, that subject you're basically uh, getting, you're looking at algebra and getting up to the point where uh, you're doing some introductory calculus. You're also looking at trigonometry, uh, logarithms, uh, graphs, but also basic, uh, basic mathematics, how to use a calculator, uh, basic geometry. So getting you up to speed with what you're going to need to go what you're going to need to use as you move through other subjects in this course. So you don't necessarily need to have had a maths background. Uh, MTH 129, uh, discrete mathematics, you're starting to look there at things like graphs, at logical functions, at truth tables, uh, Boolean algebra, and something called uh, big O notation. Big O doesn't stand for Ray Orbison. Big O notation in computing uh, really is, is referring to an analysis of the complexity of the algorithms that we might choose. 
And one thing you'll, you'll find when you do computer science, you can write something that solves a problem, but we need to make sure that what we write, the program that we write with the code, uh, solves that problem as efficiently as possible because we want to solve the problem quickly. So we don't want to write a search algorithm which takes 15 minutes to search. We'd rather write one that takes you know, much, much less time depending on the amount of data that we feed it. So analysis of algorithms is another uh, aspect of that subject and an important one within computer science. Yes, there's also, Sean, there is a study link course to help with the maths. Uh, good point bringing that one up. We, we do have a number of study link courses. Uh, they're free, uh, free for enrolled students. Uh, you can do those on your own volition. Uh, they're shorter courses and they can help bring you up to speed with things like maths, uh, statistics, but also writing essays at university can be a challenge to people uh, who, who are not used to, to writing uh, essays using academic referencing. There's not too much of essay writing within the Bachelor of Computer Science, more so in the Bachelor of IT, but we do have a lot of support courses available there. Okay, so one of the options within the Computer Science course is to do the games programming uh, specialisation. And you can see there that if you do that specialisation, that's they're the list of subjects that you need to undertake. So just going through these ones quickly, games design is all about uh, a bit like software planning for your game, uh, the narrative of a game. Uh, it's surprising to some people when I talk about games having a plot. Some games have a pretty thin plot, but if you're going to create a really mind-blowing game, then it's probably going to have some sort of a, a plot, a structure. Uh, it's going to have different levels that users need to progress through in order to maintain their interest. So all of those things are part of the theory of games design. In that subject as well, we also look at the broad history of, of the game industry, how it's evolved, uh, highlights uh, important games throughout the industry that you might like to use as reference points and study further. So a full overview of that. ITC 209, we've treated that one before. That's all about uh, designing apps for the mobile platform very important, I guess, with games because the mobile platform is such a big platform for the games industry. Okay, so you can think of games like Candy Crush and uh, Angry Birds, a lot of others out there that I'm not aware of, uh, but it's, it's a really big market. So we teach you that. Uh, a couple of units there on graphics, uh, for example, 363 Computer Graphics and 320 Advanced Graphics. So you're looking at things there such as creating uh, 2D and 3D graphics objects, uh, modelling objects, also things such as uh, shading and texture. Uh, so quite sophisticated techniques for designing a game which, which does have all those different visual elements. Uh, so using graphics systems there to be able to uh, have objects that can interact with each other and where we can paint light and shade, deal with different textures and indeed different sounds. So a, a lot of those graphic subjects is where we use the mathematics that was taught earlier in the, in the program. Uh, Games 2, ITC 372 is an interesting one. It's just been redesigned and that's really all about using existing games engines. So when we think about games programming, we don't always need to start from scratch. There's a lot of games engines out there for example, Unity, the Unity Games Engine, where you've got an enormous collection of tools to design very sophisticated games without having to design things, objects and widgets from scratch. And I think Unity allows you to deploy very sophisticated games across a number of different platforms. For example, uh, with mobile platforms, Unity, I believe, can be deployed across iOS and Windows Mobile as well as Android. So Games 2 does teach you to use existing engines. Uh, another thing you might want to do is program uh, mods. So for example, programming uh, mods to Minecraft. All, all very useful stuff and can be very commercial as well. Okay, question there from Chris. Uh, has three years experience as a network admin. Um, so Chris, if you've got about three, three or more years experience at a professional level, 
and it sounds like you have, possibly I would be looking for entry into postgraduate IT. So I, I think uh, perhaps Sandra can can send you the link for the, the webinar next next week where we talk about our postgrad IT programs. But if you do have three or more years experience in a, in a fairly senior IT role, then there is a pathway for you into postgraduate IT, basically as a, a way of, of recognising your experience. So I would, I would come back as well next week, Chris, and just have a look at what we have to offer at the postgraduate level. Uh, we have 303 and 309 here as well, software development projects one and two. Uh, and like the BIT, here you're delivering a project. In this case, it's going to be a game. So these are what are called capstone units. They occur at the end of your degree. And if you're studying this particular specialisation, you're going to design a substantial game as, as part of your capstone. It means you come out of this degree not just having the theory, but you've also developed a substantial computer game as part of your study. Okay, something to show, show off as, a, as part of your resume. Now, one thing I always mention to people that uh, you might go into games programming in this course and sometimes people worry, sometimes parents, that what happens if you don't get a job within the games industry? And we have designed the course so that it allows you a little bit of manoeuvrability. So even if you don't get into the games industry, even if uh, as you leave university you get a great opportunity to work for a business, uh, what this course allows you to become is a great programmer. So although you might study great games programming, it doesn't mean that if you don't end up on the development team uh, for Far Cry or, or Halo or whatever, then there's still an opportunity. You haven't wasted your education. You're still going to be very employable as a computer programmer in, in a variety of different fields. Okay, so good insurance for you as a student. The other option, if you don't want to follow a particular gut, the, the games programming specialisation, is just to follow the generic computer science stream, stream and that allows you uh, to essentially choose six subjects from a broad list. So we've got a list there. There'll be others added to that list from next year. There may be some taken away, uh, but this does give you the, the option of just not focusing so much on, on just games, but spreading further afield. You can do a little bit of games, but you might also do uh, some uh, more maths. You might do uh, cloud computing. You might do a little bit of networking. And certainly if there's subjects there that aren't mentioned, that are available and that you have interest in, then we can look at those uh, for your electives within this course. Students do learn about gaming engines um, in ITC 372. Are games, what's called Games 2. So you actually do look at a number of gaming engines and in fact program, program using those engines. Okay, so that occurs in uh, the Games 2 unit within the uh, computer game specialisation. But you can also do it within this generic computer science stream as well. So there's no restrictions here about what you choose. Okay, let's just look a little bit about the, the mechanics of studying by distance. Uh, as a CSU student, you're given access to an online environment, so very distance friendly. There's no need to ever visit the campus if you don't want to as a distance student. You're, you're given a login to your own portal uh, and you're allowed to, within that portal, you have access to your subjects, you have access to all your assessments, uh, typically there's module lessons within that portal uh, and, and as well for most subjects there's a textbook. Within the portal uh, there's different tools used to communicate with students by the lecturer and also between students. So there's forums and blogs where you can ask questions of the lecturer. Uh, increasingly we're seeing webinars like this for distance education lectures. So I, I can't say that it happens in every subject Different lecturers use different techniques, but increasingly we're seeing lecturers give their lecturers online over the net. Okay, so you can be kicking back at home after a hard day at work and actually having your lecture uh, on the computer. It, it would be recorded 
as, as well as reading your textbook and communicating uh, through other means such as forums. Uh, question there from Mike, is there a stream for web development? Not within computer science. Web development, Mike, is not, is not a strong uh, area in our curriculum at the moment. Okay, so I need to be upfront there. It, it's not it's not a major feature of our curriculum. There is a little bit on web development, but if you are looking to, to, to really specialise in, in in web development, uh, sort of great great graphics, great great website design, uh, then at the moment these courses aren't for you. We're more focused on on computer programming and computer networking and systems administration. Assignment submission is all online, so no having to sort of type up assignments and put them in the mail, as you would expect in this day and age. Uh, everything can be submitted online. So the whole thing can be transacted electronically. Uh, a lot of e-books and e-journals available online for consultation as well. No residential requirements except for in the network engineering stream of the Bachelor of IT. Uh, there is a weekend residential uh, to allow you to come into a networking lab uh, if you're studying the network engineering stream and to basically go over all the Cisco material and, and to get hands-on experience with uh, configuring a network, playing around with routers and switches. So if you're in that particular stream, uh, then there is a weekend residential, one weekend for, for uh, I think, each of the different subjects. So there's three subjects, so there would be three weekends uh, if you're doing those three network engineering subjects. Uh, flexibility is another big feature of our courses. Uh, Bachelor of IT and the Bachelor of Computer Science do share a lot of common subjects, which is interesting because you can start in one and end up transferring to the other. That's, that's not uncommon. A student might start out in computer science and then think, well, actually, this is, pardon me, not quite for me. I'd like to take a more business-oriented approach. And normally not an issue then simply to transfer it over into the other program with all the subjects that you've done credited across. Uh, do recommend though if you do decide to switch courses, you do that fairly early in the piece rather than later. Because the more subjects that you study, uh, the more likely they are to be inconsistent with any other new program. So, uh, but it's certainly an option. Uh, it was mentioned before about can you sort of speed things up? We certainly can uh, fast track uh, if you want to take on more than the standard study load. Uh, Chris, uh, more on the network engineering where you need to visit a campus. Yeah, Sandra might just get down your details and uh, I can uh, give you a little bit more information. I can even get you in touch with the, the lecturer of those subjects. She's a Cisco certified trainer and uh, she can perhaps provide you with some more info. On, on what's required. If you can just let us know, are, are you looking for information more about the curriculum or about the, the weekend workshops? Uh, just let Sandra know and we'll get back uh, in contact with you. So fast tracking, certainly it's possible to increase your study load. The normal study load for a distance education student is two subjects in a session. That can obviously ex extend out your degree for, for quite a while. Um, you can increase your study load up to four subjects a session. Four subjects is equivalent to a full-time study load. Uh, we look at cases individually. I mean, if you're failing subjects and studying one or two at a time, obviously not recommended and you probably wouldn't be approved to go up to a, a higher study load. But if you're cruising through and maybe you've got some time off work or maybe you're finding because you've got experience the content in particular units quite easy, then we can certainly look at allowing you to study more in a session. There also is the opportunity to take leave of absence or to cut back on your study load. If you're finding that you're busy at work for a certain time of the year or you want to take uh, a full session off uh, to concentrate on something else, there's certainly the option to do that, no questions asked. I think students are allowed about three, three or four sessions uh, leave over the duration of their degree that effectively amounts to about two years off if you want to without, without having to sort of get special permission for that. Entry requirements for the Bachelor of IT, um, for those of you coming in with an ATAR, the, the, the ATAR level is 65, there is some room for movement there, so 
Uh, it really depends. We'd like to see people, if they do have an ATAR less than 65, to have done some computing studies at school and to have gone well in that area. Um, if you've got professional certifications, we would look at that as an entry criteria. Uh, any work experience within the IT area potentially uh, would allow you entry into the program. And if you have TAFE certification from Cert 3 up, not only might you be eligible for credit, uh, Cert 4 and up entitles you potentially to credit within the program, but also gets you access to uh, the program. So it allows you uh, entry into the Bachelor of IT. If in doubt, just let us know. Call us. We can talk about your circumstances. Maybe you haven't studied at high school for a long time. Uh, maybe you've had a little bit of work experience in IT, maybe in a different field. Uh, we do like to give people the opportunity to enter into our courses if they think they can handle it and they really want to do it. So if you don't fit any of those criteria, still please get in touch and we can have a talk. Uh, entry requirements for the Bachelor of Computer Science, similar uh, ATAR 65, uh, looking for strong performance in the IT area. English and maths, interestingly, is often a good predictor of students who go well in computer science. So if you're a high school person uh, looking to get into the program, we would look at your English and maths as well. Once again, professional certifications, work experience, or TAFE, uh, minimum set four for the computer science degree would also allow you entry. Uh, doesn't hurt that you have a strong passion for computer programming. I think that's that's really the thing. Uh, that's what you're going to be consumed with if you enter this course. So again, if you don't meet any of those criteria, but you do a lot of programming at home, uh, talk to us. We can we can look at whether there's a pathway for you. Uh, so Anthony has said he's a Microsoft, got some Microsoft and CCNA certifications. They would certainly entitle you to credit Anthony within the Bachelor of Information Technology. You'd be entitled to a number of credits on the basis of those professional certifications. Uh, whether or not you should do the Bachelor of IT, you might be eligible for entry into postgraduate depending on, on how long or if you've been working in the industry. But they would certainly entitle you to a fair amount of credit. CCNA you'd probably be looking at three subjects credit, another one or two subjects for the MCSA, so you'd be looking at uh, ballpark six credits, five or six credits. I'd need to have a look at those to actually assess the credit. Um, I'd consider postgrad if you've been working in the industry, okay, if, you, if you've got professional certifications already. Time commitment, uh, two sessions per year is uh, the periods in which you study at CSU, the third session over Christmas. There are some subjects available that you can study, but it's not required. Um, each CSU subject is designed so that overall you're engaged in about 140 to 160 hours of learning over the duration of the session. That works out to about 10 hours per week per subject. So you can do a quick calculation there. If you're doing a full-time load of four subjects, to do those subjects justice, you're looking at about 40 hours study over the week. So that's, that's a hefty amount of study if you're going to take on that much load. So the recommendation for people who are doing it part-time is, is two subjects or 20 hours per week. That's going to vary according to your background, your previous study experience. It's just a, a guide as to how much time it's going to take you. We mentioned credit. Credit's a good way to cut down the length of your degree, also the cost. Uh, if you have TAFE uh, qualifications, by all means, add those to your, add those to your application. Uh, and it might be TAFE qualifications in a different area from IT. It might be in business. It might be in electronics. Always add them to your application. We will look at those for credit if, if we feel they're, they're uh, viable or, or, or worthy of credit within the context of the course. Certainly you will credit for any previous undergraduate study you've done. As Anthony mentioned, he's got industry certifications as some of you do. That also entitles you to credit. So anything that you think you have as a qualification, uh, add that to your application. That will come to me and I will assess that for credit. We don't give credit for work experience. So you might have been a, a programmer for a long time. Uh, we can't credit that into our undergraduate degrees. 
What I do say though is if you have got extensive work experience, look at possibly going to the, the postgraduate level on the basis of that work experience rather than coming into an undergraduate program. Um, if, if you want to have a look at what credit you might get before you apply, happy to hear from you. You can email me, uh, just attach any documents to the email and I'll give you a, an assessment, a pre-credit assessment um, once I look at those documents and shoot you an email back and you'll get a sense of how much credit you would get. Okay, Sean. Uh, okay, so if you're if you've got a fair bit of experience in the IT industry, as well as multiple certs, I'm assuming you're enrolled at CSU. Um, we could look at doing a course transfer if you wanted to move across to postgrad level. Um, Sandra, if we can get Sean's details, and I can get back in touch with Sean or Sean, you can email me directly, jhouth at csu.edu.au uh, and we can talk about that uh, tomorrow. I can have a look at your case tomorrow and we can uh, advise you from there. Okay, the cost. Um, Bachelor of Information Technology and the Bachelor of Computer Science. Uh, Commonwealth supported places available. Uh, that basically means that the government uh, also contributes um, and you can get HECS and help loans so you don't have to pay for your study up front, you only pay for it once you go out and start earning above a certain threshold. For those of you who heard the budget announcements, there might be some changes there with thresholds etc. At the moment though none of that is passed into legislation so uh, we're not 100% sure of where that's going uh, but current fees are uh, 1,076 per undergraduate subject and you can defer that depending on your on your situation. Uh, for international students who want to do distance education, they're, they're not uh, eligible for the Commonwealth supported low uh, funding, so the cost there is what we call full fee paying and that's 2400 per subject. You need to keep in mind that textbook costs are additional to these costs, so as a rule of thumb, each subject will have a textbook and that textbook is probably going to be in the range of $120 to $150. Or $120 to $150 might be less. Some subjects might have two textbooks. It's just something you need to keep in mind when you're budgeting your overall, overall study plan. So those textbook costs have to be met by you. There's also a student services and amenities fee of $34 per subject, which, which is payable to the university. So that's a rough guide as to, as to uh, the cost and you can multiply those uh, subject costs out by 24 subjects. If you fail a subject, you don't get a refund. Um, so bear that in mind. I mean, the, the quicker you finish and the less subjects uh, that you fail, um, the cheaper your degree program costs. So um, it, it's all part of the overall equation. Uh, applying, you can apply online, uh, www.csu.edu.au forward slash apply. Closing day for applications is the 9th of June, so not a long time left. Sometimes we, we do extend the application date, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't bank on that. So if you are looking at getting an application in, please do that by the 9th of June. Uh, the session starts on the 14th of July. Um, I often say to people, if in doubt, you may, maybe you're in two minds as to whether you would be suited to this or not. You can apply, you can start. and you can start studying subjects, and you you have you have the ability to pull out of the subjects and of the out of the course before what's called the census date, which is about four weeks into your subjects once you start. So I read about mid August, um, and you can pull out before the census date and not be liable for any subject fees. Of course, any fees you spend on textbooks, you've obviously paid those, but you can start and as I say, pull out before the census date and uh, you won't be up for any, any subject fees. So please consider applying uh, by that date if uh, you're looking to study with us. So more infos, more information, you can uh, address uh, general inquiries to Sandra who's been helping us out tonight in the questions window. There's a toll free number there as well as an email address inquiry at csu.edu.au 
all other academic inquiries you can address to me. Uh, there's my phone number, I'd probably prefer to have email, uh, jhowth at csu.edu.au, always happy to hear from prospective students. So if you have any questions at all, whether it's relating to credit, uh, information about subjects, anything you want to know, no questions are uh, out of bounds, so please get in touch and, and ask me. So I think we've come to the end of my presentation. My voice is pretty worn out. I'll have to go home and, and have a, a lemon tea. Um, might just open it up for any more questions, uh, Sandra, and then we'll uh, call it quits for the night. So thanks very much, everyone, for attending and listening. Really appreciated you coming along. A um, few things I've got to follow up on tomorrow, Sandra. Uh, we'll have a record of those, and I can uh, follow up on a few of the questions and queries. Um, but just open it up now for a minute or so for any other questions before we sign out. How do exams work? Uh, it, most subjects have exams, Sean, uh, not all. There's a, there's a couple of subjects without exams. They're normally pretty popular with students, but uh, most subjects have a final exam. Uh, that exam comes in the two-week window after the subject finishes. It's scheduled on a particular day at a particular time. You are allocated what's called an exam centre, which is close to where where you live or where you work, so we won't make you travel more than a certain number of kilometres. I'm not sure exactly what the, the number is to an exam centre. Um, so it, it, it probably is going to be a place fairly close to you. It might be another university. It might be a church. Uh, we've even had people have exams while uh, serving overseas on ships. Uh, so you're allocated an exam centre which you can change uh, and it's your responsibility to be at that exam centre at the time and day that your exam is offered. Okay, so you're advised well in advance of, of where your exam centre is and towards the end of the session you're told uh, when your exam is scheduled. And you basically go along, you present your ID and you sit your exam which is typically two hours long uh, and we, we have a, um, a person walking around, a vigil invigilator, who basically walks around the examination centre. There's quite often a few students in the centres. Walks around, makes sure people aren't talking or, or looking at hidden notes. And basically you, you sit there, finish your exam, uh, hand it in, finds its way back to the lecturer who, who marks and issues you with your final grade for the subject. Okay, so look, I'll assume there's there's no more questions tonight, Sandra. If there are any, we can uh, address those uh, outside of this through through email. So, just like to thank everyone so much for attending tonight. Really uh, appreciate you could come along in what is fairly late time of the evening, I guess. Uh, so, thanks once again. Look forward to seeing you if you want to study at CSU, and look forward to uh, look forward to answering any questions that you might have. Thanks once again, have a great night and hopefully talk again soon.